Now there was a certain man of Ramathaim Zophim of Mount Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroam, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zeph, and Ephrathite. And he had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other Peninnah. And Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. And this man went up out of his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. And when the time was that Elkanah offered, he gave to Peninnah his wife and to all her sons and her daughters portions. But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah, but the Lord had shut up her womb. And her adversary also provoked her sore for to make her fret, because the Lord had shut up her womb. And as he did so year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her. Therefore she wept and did not eat. Then said Elkanah her husband to her, Hannah, why weepest thou, and why eatest thou not, and why is thy heart grieved? Am not I better to thee than ten sons? So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh, and after they had drunk. Now Eli the priest sat upon a seat by a post of the temple of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul, and prayed unto the Lord, and wept sore. And she vowed a vow, and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid, and remember me, and not forget thine handmaid, but wilt give unto thine handmaid a man-child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. And it came to pass, as she continued praying before the Lord, that Elah marked her mouth. Now Hannah, she spake in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Elah thought she had been drunken. And Eli said unto her, How long wilt thou be drunken? Put away thy wine from thee. And Hannah answered and said, No, my lord, I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Count not thine handmaid for a daughter of Bilal, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken hitherto. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. And she said, Let thine handmaid find grace in thy sight. So the woman went her way, and did eat, and her countenance was no more sad. And they rose up in the morning early, and worshipped before the Lord, and returned, and came to their house to Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah his wife, and the Lord remembered her. Therefore it came to pass, when the time was come about after Hannah had conceived, that she bare a son, and called his name Samuel, saying, Because I have asked him of the Lord. So, let's look closely at this. There was a certain man of Ramathaim Zophim. From what I've read, most scholars don't agree where exactly this was, which tells me maybe that's why God clarified it by adding, of Mount Ephraim. So, where did he live? Mount Ephraim in Ramathaim Zophim. His name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroam, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zeph, and Ephrathite. According to 1 Chronicles 6, 33-38, Elkanah wasn't just an Ephrathite, he was also a Levite. In this section of genealogy, we see his descendants and his ancestors in a big sweep of history. And these are they that waited with their children, of the sons of the Kohathites, Heman a singer, the son of Joel, the son of Shemuel, Samuel, the son of Elkanah, the son of Jeroam, the son of Eliel, the son of to- Toa, the son of Zeph, the son of Elkanah, the son of Mahath, the son of Amasai, the son of Elkanah, the son of Joel, the son of Azariah, the son of Zephaniah, the son of Tehath, the son of Asir, the son of Abiasaph, the son of Korah, the son of Izhar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, the son of Israel. So we have Elkanah, a man named God has possessed, with a strong family lineage. Apparently he was another man whose parents wanted him to belong to God. Elkanah was a Levite, an Ephrathite living in Mount Ephraim, right here on the map. Was there a king in Israel yet? No, it was still the days of the judges. So let's look at one of the other stories that happened back in the days of the judges, around this time probably. Let's go to Judges 19. And it came to pass in those days, when there was no king in Israel, that there was a certain Levite sojourning on the side of Mount Ephraim, who who took to him a concubine out of Bethlehem, Judah. And his concubine played the whore against him, and went away from him unto her father's house to Bethlehem, Judah, and was there four whole months. And her husband arose and went after her to speak friendly unto her, and to bring her again, having his servant with him and a couple of asses. And she brought him into her father's house. And when the father of the damsel saw him, he rejoiced to meet him. And his father-in-law, the damsel's father, retained him, and he abode with him three days. So they did eat and drink and lodge there. 
Remember Bethlehem, Judah? This is the same land where Elimelech fled from the famine to go sojourn in Moab. Bethlehem, Judah is the special place where Rachel was buried. Remember, it was the place Naomi would return after the famine, having lost her husband and her sons, and all she would have would be just a Moabite daughter-in-law. This is not a lesson on the Bethlehem Judah concubine, although there are plenty of lessons to learn there. But just think, these people, Elimelech, Naomi, the Levite, the concubine, Elkanah, they didn't live in their own little secluded chapters. They were connected. They lived in villages. They grew up together, and they reminisced these stories to their grandchildren. You can be sure that men of Bethlehem Judah like Elimelech and Boaz probably at some point spoke in hushed tones about the girl who grew up with them who became a concubine to that Levite who lived in Mount Ephraim, especially after a chunk of her body got shipped to them and they heard the story what had happened to her. Then all the children of Israel went out, and the congregation was gathered together as one man from Dan even to Beersheba, with the land of Gilead unto the Lord in Mizpah. And the chief of all the people, even of all the tribes of Israel, presented themselves to the ascent in the assembly of the people of God, 400,000 footmen that drew sword. Now the children of Benjamin heard that the children of Israel were gone up to Mizpah. Then said the children of Israel, Tell us, how was this wickedness? And the Levite, the husband of the woman that was slain, answered and said, I came into Gibeah that belonged to Benjamin, I and my concubine to lodge. And the men of Gibeah rose against me and beset the house round about round about upon me by night, and thought to have slain me. And my concubine have they forced that she is dead. And I took my concubine, and cut her in pieces, and sent her throughout all the country of the inheritance of Israel. For they have committed lewdness and folly in Israel. Behold, ye are all children of Israel. Give here your advice and counsel. If you're old enough, you probably remember the sick feeling that we all felt on September 11, 2001. No matter how far away we were from New York City, we, we can remember where we were that day. And this story of what happened to this concubine is disgusting and shocking to think about thousands of years later. So when Beth Benjamin refused to extradite the perverts and the rest of the nation rose up to fight them, it looked as though an entire tribe of Israel was going to be wiped out. That's when they said the maidens of Shiloh could come out and dance and the surviving Benjamites could kidnap them since no man of Israel would willingly give them their daughter to marry. This was a traumatizing time to be alive. As, as traumatizing as September 11th was, as traumatizing as things we've been through in the past 20 years have been, this was much more traumatizing for such a tiny little nation to go through. The Bible is not specific about the timeline of certain events, except to say that they happened in the days of the judges, before a king ruled in Israel. We don't know exactly when Ruth came to Israel. We just know that it was three generations before David, so probably sometime right before Hannah and Elkanah. We don't know exactly when the Levite went to retrieve his concubine from Bethlehem, Judah, when he spent that gruesome night in Gibeah of Benjamin. Apparently, it happened toward the end of the days of the Judges, since it's the last story in the book of Judges. We don't know exactly when Elkanah lived in Mount Ephraim. We do know that he was the father of the last of the Judges, so I'm assuming that all these things happened close to one another, at least in the same era. If Elkanah was also a Levite living in Mount Ephraim, it's quite possible that he knew this Levite whose concubine ran away. Imagine what that would do to you, hearing such a story about a man that you know, maybe even a relative, maybe even a closer relative. As the last verse in Judges says, at that time, at this time, there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. So we have a society of men whose only law is something passed down and celebrated in a tabernacle in Shiloh that they may or may not even visit. They have no human king to answer to. They needed a godly man to be raised up, another judge. They needed someone who would hold them to the law, who would remind them a Savior was coming, someone who would keep them sacrificing, keep them worshiping, keep them from being dispersed into judgment again. God had promised terrible things for them if they fell away. They could even get plucked out of the land of Israel and land up in captivity far away if they fell too far from the truth. But there is no godly judge at this time. 
there's just Eli and his reprobate sons. Every man does that which is right in his own eyes. If they want to take a concubine, they do it. If the men want to leave and move to Moab, they do it. If the men want to gather around a house like the Sodomites did and word for word demand that the man be handed over to them, they do it. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Sound familiar? And Elkanah had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other Peninnah. And Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. This was not a nice time to be a woman. Talk about feeling powerless. If your husband wanted to move to Moab, you go. If your man wants to hand you over to let a gang of lustful thugs do what they want, out the door you go. If you can't have a baby and your husband wants children, even if he loves you, move over, sweetie. Such was the plight of Hannah. Her husband had married another woman, and this woman was able to bear him children, and Hannah couldn't. And this man went up out of his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. Now this is the book of Samuel. Whenever I read this story, I've always impatiently skipped through the Elkanah part because to me this is Hannah's story. Elkanah never interested me until I studied this. In light of the other lessons about Naomi and Ruth and the other women we've studied, it began to dawn on me that the book of Samuel has some richness in these first verses about Hannah's husband, the guy who always seemed in the way of the real story about the precious mother who trusted God and was rewarded. But now it hit me. If woman was created for man, why wouldn't the story center around Elkanah? Because that's who's at the center of the story up to now. Never before have I ever considered that Elkanah was worthy of a thought. It didn't penetrate my brain that maybe God tells the story from Elkanah's perspective for a reason. This is a lesson about Hannah, don't worry. But before we can learn from Hannah's story, we need to start it from the angle that God tells it, and He tells it focused on Elkanah. So, what about Elkanah? Like I said, based on the probable timeline, considering that he'd be the father of the last of the judges, it makes sense to assume he lived late in that period. Since the story of the Levite and the concubine's rape and attack happened at the close of the book of Judges, I do think it's appropriate to guess it may have been within the same generation or at least close to it. And since Elkanah was a Levite living in Mount Ephraim, just like the famous Levite in Judges 19, I think it's quite likely he knew of, and possibly knew, personally, the Levite. So, and this is scary since the male brain is a great mystery, if I put myself in Elkanah's shoes, here's what I might think, maybe. Ugh, that Levite did not take care of that woman. Concubine, a real man marries his woman, he doesn't just use her, what is the world coming to? Ugh, those Benjamites, those men of Gibeah trying to defile that Levite and then abusing that girl like that, what is this world coming to? Oh, those priests. Did you hear what they're doing with the women who come to the house of God? Shameful. What is this world coming to? And then he goes into the house to his two wives. The Bible says every man did that which was right in his own eyes. They didn't base their lives on some absolute standard. If a man did something, it was because it seemed right to him. Elkanah was faithful to the tabernacle every year. He apparently didn't have a concubine. He had one wife, Hannah, whom he loved, and he had another wife, Peninnah, who gave him children. Children would provide for his old age. It was just the way things were. Not ideal, but such was life. How many men are like Elkanah? They look at the filthy culture around them, shake their head, and live in hypocrisy, making choices that hurt people, and they're clueless. And when the time was that Elkanah offered, he gave to Peninnah his wife and to all her sons and her daughters portions, but unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah, but the Lord had shut up her womb. We don't know the circumstances of his marriage to, to either Hannah or Peninnah. We just know that Hannah was to him more of a pet. He gave her extra. She was his love. He was good to both of his wives, though. He was a good man. Hannah had to bear the weight of his doing things his way. Because in the beginning, there was one man and one woman. In the New Testament, when Jesus revealed how he wanted things, it was back to the original design. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. So then they are no more twain, but one flesh. Twain means two. 
not three. A man couldn't even be a deacon unless he was the husband of one woman. And her adversary also provoked her sore for to make her fret, because the Lord had shut up her womb. And as he did so year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her. Therefore she wept and did not eat. Poor Hannah. She had absolutely no way to escape this nightmare. Can you imagine knowing you aren't the only woman who has a right to your husband? That would be bad enough. But then for that other woman to constantly point out your greatest weakness. Think of your greatest weakness, the thing you'd love to change about yourself. And then picture another woman living in your house who's strong in that area. It makes my blood run cold just to think of it. And Hannah's problem wasn't just that she had no figure or that her teeth stuck out or she had no eyelashes. She had no children. That is a knife in the heart. I remember after we lost our first child how I feared I would be unable to have children. I remember quietly sobbing after church up the hill as toddlers like Andrew, Maddie, and Frankie would jump off the platform. And I would just ache wondering if I'd ever have a child. Then said Elkanah, her husband, to her, Hannah, why weepest thou, and why eatest thou not? And why is thy heart grieved? Am not I better to thee than ten sons? This man, he sees himself as a really good man. He's religious, he's moral, he's generous. What's not to love? How can she be sad? He was clueless to her pain of not being enough. In his mind, he was enough, she was enough, so why cry? He couldn't fathom her pain, the way it felt to be shamed constantly over a weakness she couldn't fix. The ache of not only wanting something God has kept from you, but also having someone gloat about their abundance in your face. And he was the cause. He had given the other woman her ammunition. He didn't get it. And she had no way to explain it to him. It is a bitter cup when you're hurting and you can't tell anybody. So many things today are so far removed from God's original intent for us. We're surrounded by alcohol, indecency, gambling, pornography, and wickedness too horrifying to think about. So much that what was shameful 20 years ago is now trendy, completely acceptable. The worldly way is not God's way, but God loves us and His mercy endures forever. But when we adopt the pattern of the world, it brings pain. And when a husband adopts the way of the world around him, it will bring the wife pain. God in His mercy may still use that man, but a lot depends on the wife and how she handles her pain. Such was the plight of Hannah. She was hurting and Elkanah couldn't see his problem. She had to decide what to do about her pain. Would she resent him for this pain he inflicted and didn't understand? So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh and after they had drunk. She could have turned against him for his callousness. Her emotions could have driven her deep into herself, down into a spiral of hopelessness. This was beyond her. But instead, she rose up. And like the Shunammite, she didn't whine to her husband about her problem. She went to God. Now, Eli the priest sat upon a seat by a post of the temple of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. That's what she did. She allowed her emotions to bring her to God. She did not let her heart harden when nobody understood. She didn't pretend that she wasn't in bitterness of soul. She let the bitterness be. She let it crumple her to her knees. She prayed unto the Lord, the only one who could do something about it, and wept sore. My granny has told me, go ahead, cry it out. Tears help. And it's true. I can look back on miracles God has done for me. Almost every time, maybe every time, there was a scene of desperate tears where all I could do was look up through tears and just cry because there were no words. And God answered miraculously. I don't know if she knew God was the one who had closed up her womb, but any time we have a problem, God has either planned it or allowed it or it wouldn't happen. He has promised to turn it to our good if we're His called, choosing to love Him in the midst of our pain. I tend to think she realized it was God who had allowed this to happen since she went to God alone for help. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid and remember me and not forget thine handmaid, but wilt give unto thine handmaid a man-child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life and there shall no razor come upon his head. She said, If thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid, see I'm hurting. 
That is a humble thing to ask. She doesn't see the world if it revolves around her. She requests that God will look on her pain. She feels invisible. She requests attention. How much trouble do we get in simply because we want someone to see us? See our pain. See how we're trying. Just see us as we are. We have not because we ask not. How wise of Hannah before anything to ask God to look on her affliction. We must, when we feel invisible, learn to ask God to look on our affliction. What an honor for the God of the universe to look on my pain. Why would I crave attention from anyone else when I feel His gaze on me? As those lustful brothers, the powerful priests, Hophni and Phinehas, scoured the place for women assembling, she had no need for them to notice her. She wanted God to notice her. Just like Hagar, thou God seest me. Next, she said, and remember me, and not forget thine handmaid. She feels forgotten, overlooked. Every time another woman rejoices with her happy news of another baby on the way, while Hannah's cycle rolls around like clockwork, she feels forgotten. Lord, will you remember me? Would he remember her? She's just one woman. Her husband's just a regular guy. She's not special. She's been waiting for so long. Had God forgotten to be gracious to her? Had he shut up his tender mercies from her on purpose? Or had he just forgotten? We're not talking about some vague great spirit here. We're talking about the Creator, the invisible God, whose image would one day walk the same country. This image of the invisible God would remember to come to a well where a certain forgotten woman would be getting water. He would take the time to wait before answering a crowd of condemning men so they would remember their own sin before casting a stone at a trembling woman. The one who stopped a throng of people swarming him to find the woman who yanked on the hem of his garment. He would command people to the end of the world to remember a woman who drenched fragrance on his feet like an extravagant servant girl. In the hour of his anguish, the image of the invisible God would look down on the woman whose anguish brought him into the world and remember to tell John to look after his mother. The same image of the invisible God would remember a woman who'd once housed seven devils and reveal his resurrection to her before he'd even ascended to his father, like a friend who won't wait to share a wonderful secret with someone dear who needs to hear some good news. That is who Hannah was asking to remember her, Jesus, the one who makes a habit of remembering forgotten women. Would he remember her and not forget her? I can just imagine the twinkle in Jesus' eye as she asked that. Yes, he would remember her. He will remember you. He will remember me. She didn't stop there. The audacity of Hannah. She said, But will give unto thine handmaid a man-child. Look on my affliction. Remember me. Don't forget me. And then the real request spills out along with her tears. I want a baby boy. I believe enough to ask specifically. I'm your handmaid. Remember me? You handmade me, my womb is closed. Please, if you'll give me a man-child. Some things you don't ask for unless you really believe. And to prove it, she goes on. Then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. Hannah had more in mind than just shutting up Peninnah. She wanted God to use her. The nation of Israel needed a godly man. As she prayed that silent, desperate prayer, she was probably well aware of the nearby evil of the priests that should have been caring for God's flock. It would get so bad that men hated offering to God because of the evil priests. The nation was weak. The young ladies from here in Shiloh had recently been kidnapped to provide wives for the surviving Benjamites. The shame of recent events had left everyone with no security for the future. They needed another Samson to, to rise up. And Hannah wanted to make a difference. She wasn't just looking to ease her own affliction. She wanted God to use her. So she made a vow. No matter how it inconvenienced you, you kept vows. That was why they let the men kidnap the women of Shiloh, because they had made a vow they wouldn't give their daughters, and they couldn't go back on it. Now at least a tribe wouldn't go extinct, and they hadn't broken their vow. Poor girls who got kidnapped. Vows were paramount. And Hannah was that serious. And it came to pass, as she continued praying before the Lord, that Eli marked her mouth. Now here's another man who can't see his own faults. Now Hannah, she spake in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she had been drunken. And Eli said unto her, How long wilt thou be drunken? Put away thy wine from thee. Just imagine, 
You're pouring out your soul to God in the best place in the world where God's presence is found, at the tabernacle. And the man of God balls you out for your bad behavior. What an amazing test of Hannah's attitude. How easy it would have been to get huffy. You think I'm drunk? Or to get distracted. Oh boy, I'm such a mess. I'm so embarrassed. I look drunk. Or to get discouraged. Wow, if the man of God thinks I'm a drunk, I must be hopeless. Or to let bitterness take over. Okay, fine. I was praying, but no more. If you're going to speak to me like I'm a common drunk. She did none of those things. She saw him as he was. A man in authority who was mistaken. She answered him gently with respect and fear, but she didn't budge from her attitude of petition to God. And Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have poured out my soul before the Lord. Count not thine handmaid for a daughter of Belial, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken hitherto. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. And she said, Let thine handmaid find grace in thy sight. So the woman went her way and did eat, and her countenance was no more sad. She passed the test. She answered him with respect, and he blessed her. God has no perfect people. We are not perfect. Our leaders are not perfect. The sooner we accept that fact and set about to stay in our own place, giving honor to whom honor is due, even if they're not perfect, the quicker we'll find our way to blessing. Believe me, this convicts me. I can be pretty snooty when I think someone's undeserving of a place of honor. But God is showing me to respect the position. Hannah honored the man of God just like she obeyed her husband without a word to his goof. Like the Shunammite again, she behaved as though it would be well. No more tears, only smiles. Our faces reveal our hearts. She had hope that things were going to turn out well. When we hope in the Lord, it shows on our face. And sometimes the way to start smiling requires a few tears and continued prayers before that hope clicks on. But the smiles will come. And they rose up in the morning early and worshipped before the Lord and returned and came to their house to Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah his wife, and the Lord remembered her. Hannah is expecting good to happen. She's no longer sad. She's getting up early, worshiping, being intimate with her husband, imperfect man that he is. When we pour out our souls before God and hold to His promises, we can't help but be excited. Everywhere around us, we hear people talking about woman power. Little Hannah didn't make the cover of, me, the cover of any tabloids then or now. She wasn't physically strong. She was barren because God had closed her womb. But like the Shunammite, she had a miraculous ending because she hoped in God. When her emotions could have ended everything, she chose to trust. Wherefore it came to pass, when the time was come about after Hannah had conceived, that she bare a son and called his name Samuel, saying, Because I have asked him of the Lord. And the man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer unto the Lord the yearly sacrifice and his vow. But Hannah went not up, for she said unto her husband, I will not go up until the child be weaned, and then I will bring him that he may appear before the Lord and there abide forever. Hannah knew that her time with her son was short. She had made a vow, and she knew she had to keep it, just as surely as any man in Israel ever knew that he had to keep his vow on pain of death of his nearest and dearest. And Elkanah her husband said unto her, Do what seemeth thee good, tarry until thou have weaned him. Only the Lord establish his word. So the woman abode and gave her son suck until she had weaned him. Imagine what those precious days of nursing her son were like. Not only is this the precious son you've prayed for, but you are going to be releasing him as soon as you wean him. He will no longer live with you, just as Moses' mother knew of her son. This child was only hers for as long as she could nurse him. That is a short time. But in that amount of time, a lot of good can happen. Moses' mother in that short time ingrained in him such a love for the people of God that he would one day refuse to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Hannah nurtured Samuel so that as soon as he was weaned, he was able to be a productive little helper who knew how to worship. And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her with three bullocks and one ephah of flour and a bottle of wine and brought him unto the house of the Lord in Shiloh, and the child was young. And they slew a bullock and brought the child to Eli. And she said, Oh, my Lord, as thy soul liveth, my Lord, I am the woman that stood by thee here, praying unto the Lord. 
for this child I prayed, and the Lord hath given me my petition which I asked of him. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. Just think if Hannah had never prayed, if she hadn't gone to God in her grief, if she had wallowed in her misery and let her heart grow hard toward her husband who didn't understand her. She would have died childless, miserable, unremembered. She'd never have had Samuel. She'd never have had five other children. We wouldn't have the books of Samuel. And that prayer wouldn't have been recorded that Hannah said next. Just listen to the joy she had after she kept her vows. And what a miracle that she was able to say these things after taking her tiny boy to leave him for life at the tabernacle. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoiceth in the Lord. Mine horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over mine enemies because I rejoice in thy salvation. There is none holy as the Lord, for there is none beside thee. Neither is there any rock like our God. Talk no more so exceeding proudly. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by Him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty men are broken, and they that stumbled are girded with strength. They that were full have hired, themselves, hired out themselves for bread, and they that were hungry ceased, so that the barren hath borne seven. And she that hath many children is waxed feeble. The Lord killeth and maketh alive. He bringeth down to the grave and bringeth up. The Lord maketh poor and maketh rich. He bringeth low and lifteth up. He raiseth up the poor out of the dust and lifteth up the beggar from the dunghill to set them among princes and to make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and he hath set the world upon them. He will keep the feet of his saints and the wicked shall be silent in darkness for by strength shall no man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Out of heaven shall he thunder upon them. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth, and he shall give strength unto his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. It's so much like Mary's song that she sang, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. For he hath regarded the lowest state of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. For he that is mighty hath done to me great things, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. He hath showed strength with his arm. He hath scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He hath put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. He hath filled the hungry with good things and the rich he hath sent empty away. He hath hope in his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spake to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever. And Elkanah went to Ramah to his house, and the child did minister unto the Lord before Eli the priest. So they left little Samuel there, there at the tabernacle, where he would serve a barking priest who accused praying women of being drunk. Eli was not a child-rearing expert, but Hannah had given her child to God, and God would teach the child, despite Eli. Just like God can teach our children if we give them to Him, despite us. I love the promise from Isaiah 54, 13. And this is the same promise that we can claim because it is promised to those who are the servants of the Lord and the righteousness is of Him. If we are serving Jesus because He is our righteousness and we aren't trusting our own righteousness, but we're trusting Jesus' righteousness, then we get to claim this promise. And all thy children shall be taught of the Lord, and great shall be the peace of thy children.